Bowen and the Dancers racing for the lead. Musket Man has some early speed on the inside. Here's Regal Ransom with some speed as well. Beneath the twin spires the first time. Regal Ransom and Join of the Dance will vie for the early lead. Pioneer of the Nile is right up there. And then it's Papa Clem down toward the inside. He's now fourth. There's a party. Forwardly placed fifth on the outside. Flying Private is sixth. Freeze and Fire in and among horses is now seventh. Musket Man is eighth. Dunkirk is ninth on the outside. Then farther back down on the rail, that is uh, Atomic Rain, uh, running in the 11th position, two lengths back, and General Quarters is now 12th. Nowhere to hide is 13th on the outside. West side, Bernie is now, now down toward the rail, and then on the outside, at the back of the pack, beginning to move up now, is uh, Hold Me Back. Advice is also right there toward the back of the pack, along with Chocolate Candy Summerbird. Advice, the last of them all is Mr. Hot Stuff. So down the back stretch run, or even be fine, be well behind the rest of them, is Mind That Bird. So down the back stretch run, and join in the dance. An impudent long shot leader here, 50 to 1, taking the field through an opening half mile that was strong, 47 and 1 fifth seconds. Regal Ransom is third. On the outside, Pioneer of the Nile. Now Garrett Gomez asking him for a bit more. He's right there. Third on the outside, Desert Party is now fourth. Hold me back, fifth toward the inside. Papa Clem threads his way through horses from sixth down. Musket Man is now seventh. Chocolate Candy is beginning to come alive now, and he's eighth on the outside. Then down toward the rail, it's advice as the field turns for home. Top of the stretch, it's still joined in the dance with a tenuous lead. Regal Ransom and Pioneer of the Nile strike the front just outside the eighth hole. Musket Man is coming hard down the side of the track, and Papa Clem's right there, too. Down toward the inside, coming on through. That is uh, my that bird now is coming on to take the lead as they come down to the finish. And a spectacular, spectacular upset. My that bird has won the Kentucky River. An impossible result here. Welcome back to Undoctrinated. Hello, everybody. This is a bonus episode. That's what I'm going to call it. It's really just another episode. Well, it's bonus. Exactly. It's a bonus for our faithful listeners. Yeah. Um, This is our Kentucky Derby special. The Kentucky Derby coming up here on Saturday, May 4th, I believe. Let me just double check that. (laughs) Have you ever watched the Kentucky Derby now? Um, mm, Do you even know the what the Kentucky Derby that is? you bet on in Las Vegas? Uh, you can definitely bet on the Kentucky Derby. Yes, it is May 4th, this Saturday. Um, that's where you um, have the horses and they're going around. Let's see. Let, let me... Uh, and then they have the little man that rides the horse and they race. And y- you bet yeah. on... Little but everybody, tiny humans ride Everybody those wears like, fan, go in there, they wear those big hats. They're like helmets that kind of look like hats. No, not the, those people, the people in the audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like they get all dressed up and they wear hats and the ladies are all like, you know, housewife of Orange County lady types walking around there. And 
Uh huh. Which yes, which like, l- leads me to the title of this episode: "The Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved" <laughs> by Hunter S. Thompson. That it is. I shall be reading that great work of Hunter S. Thompson. The great late work. Um. So I have an article here that I'm not going to read, but I'm going to skim through it. Kentucky Derby odds. Picks 2019, Omaha Beach, Maximum Security, Roadster, Predictions from Horse Racing Insider. I'm going with Roadster. Yeah. Is that the name of a horse? I think so. Yeah, Roadster. I like that name. Yeah. Let's see. Roadster's a winner. Arkansas Derby. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know anything about horse racing. What is I've that from? The, Jeopardy? Yeah, that's, remember. Jeff, that's okay. Jeff, Jeopardy. Um, just give me some odds. Okay, I'm going to not look at this article. Let's go over the odds for the Kentucky Derby. What are How does that even work Betting for horses? Odds. Oh, like let's say roadsters, like, you mean like favored to win those types of odds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. And they change for horse racing, like. Obvious, well, obviously, the odds change for everything, but even if after you place your bet, I think the odds can change on you in horse what? racing. That doesn't seem yeah, fair. Yeah, so the odds don't lock in until the race actually starts, I believe. Oh, but once the race is going, the odds don't change. No, yeah, once the oh, race that's is going, they're, they're locked in before the race starts. I thought you meant once the race starts, they can change the odds, and I'm like, how is that even fair? <laughs> okay, Kentucky Derby odds. Let's make sure. Yeah, 2019. Time to place your bets. Um, okay, is this a... Oh, yeah, these must be horse names. Another another twist of fate. Yeah. <laughs> Has 25 to 1. That's the fractional odds. Oh, I thought that was the horse name. See? Okay. Another twist of fate is the horse name. Right. One of, 25 to 1, I thought was the horse name, too. Yeah. Um... Bod Express, 33 to 1. Bourbon War, 25 to 1. The lower the number, the better, or the higher number? The lower number means the they're lower, more favored to the win? Lower, yeah, the lower means they're more oh, favored. Oh, so Bourbon so far is in the lead. Okay. Nope. Well, Bourbon War and another, another Twist of Fate are both 25 to 1. Oh, I thought you said it was 35. Bod, Bod Express is 33 to 1, so oh, okay. he's the long shot so far. Yeah, okay. Uh, by My Standards, 25 to 1. Code of Honor, 16 to 1. Oh. Country House, 50 to 1. 50? Yeah, he's, oh. he's, or he or she is not the long shot here, but that is so far the long shot. Cutting Humor, 20 to 1. Game Winner, 7 to 1. So that's the wow. favorite so far. Yeah. Not the odds on favorite for the whole race. Um, Gray Magician, 35 to 1. High call, 20 to 1. Improbable is 9 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> These are some weird odds. Long range toddy. Oh, I like that name. 33 to 1. Little long range toddy. Master fence, 66 to 1. Maximum security, 10 to 1. Omaha beach, 11 to 2. I don't understand these odds. They're very so all over the place. So Omaha Beach and Roadster are the favorites. Uh, Roadster is the slight favorite at five to one, and Omaha Beach is just behind them at eleven to two. Uh, plus Q Parfait twenty to one, Signal Man forty to one, Spin Off twenty five to one, Sueno sixty six to one, Tacitus. Or Tacitus, I don't know what that is. Ten to one. Tax, twenty-five to one. Vicoma, thirteen to one. War of Will, twenty to one. Win, win, win. Twenty to one. <laughs> <laughs> win, win, win. Like the Winston ad you were reading. Oh, the last okay, episode. okay. It's a win, win, win. That's funny. I'm gonna say. I'm gonna throw the life savings on. No. Yeah. I'm not betting on those wild things. Definitely not tax. Fuck that horse. 
We're not betting on these derbies. Don't you uh, have to be down in the derby to bet on I guess the derby? I like Bourbon War the best as far as the names go. Do you have go. to be down in the derby to uh, vote? I mean, uh, bet on the derby? No, you can be in Vegas. Probably There's probably a ton of websites you can... In fact, I'm on usracing.com and there's a button that says bet now. I'm going to click on it. No. But enjoy the excitement of the Kentucky Derby with a free bet. Great welcome bonus and exclusive Nothing's free. Odds. You'll have to deposit a certain amount of money in there just to get started. Yeah, they want my information. Oh, yeah, they do. To give you that free bet. I'll get right on that when we're done recording the episode. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved by Hunter S. Thompson. He sure is. Um, let's see if I have any, any background on this story. I should have actually looked that up before because I know he talks about it a lot in uh, Proud Highway. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe before we record the outro, I'll look at some of the stuff in Proud Highway that he talks about it and we can bring that up. But I think it was written for Scanlan Monthly. It's kind of, if I remember correctly, this was early in Thompson's career. Um, like this was before, for sure, before Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and the Campaign Trail. And I think this might have even been before the Hell's Angels. Oh, wow. I could be wrong. This uh, was one of the, was the first assignment I think that he worked with Ralph Steadman. Oh yeah, I was just about to say I think that. Okay, he no, was this there. was after the Hell's Angels. This is June 1970. But yeah, oh. it was Scanlan's month monthly. Um, yeah, Hell's Angels was like 1965, so it was actually well after that. Um, so here we go. Let's get into it. Enjoy, everybody. Monty worked for the forestry, but he couldn't make ends meet. Monty went to the hydro store, soon he became part of the town elite. Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. I got off the plane around midnight, and no one spoke as I crossed the dark runway to the terminal. The air was thick and hot, like wandering into a steam bath. Inside, people hugged each other and shook hands, big grins, and a whoop here and there. By God, you old bastard, good to see you, boy. Damn good, and I mean it. In the air-conditioned lounge, I met a man from Houston who said his name was something or other, but just call me Jimbo, and he was here to get it on. I'm ready for anything, by God, 
Anything at all. Yeah, what are you drinking? I ordered a margarita with ice, but he wouldn't hear of it. Nah, nah, what the hell kind of drink is that for the Kentucky Derby time? What's wrong with you, boy? He grinned and winked at the bartender. God damn, we gotta educate this boy. Get him some good whiskey. I shrugged. Okay, a double old fits on ice. Jimbo nodded his approval. Look, he tapped me on the arm to make sure I was listening. I know this derby crowd. I come here every year. And, t- and let me tell you one thing I've learned. This is no town to be giving people the impression you're some kind of faggot. Not in public, anyway. Shit, they'll roll you in a minute, knock you in the head, and take every goddamn cent you have. I thanked him and fitted a Marlboro into my cigarette holder. Say, he said, you look like you might be in the horse business, am I right? No, I said, I'm a photographer. Oh, yeah? He eyed my ragged leather bag with new interest. Is that what you got there? Cameras? Who you work for? Playboy, I said. He laughed. Well, goddamn, what are you going to take pictures of? Naked horses? <laughs> I guess you'll be working pretty hard when they run the Kentucky Oaks. That's a race for the Phillies. He was laughing wildly. Hell yes, and they'll all be naked too. I shook my head and said nothing, just stared at him for a moment, trying to look grim. There's going to be trouble, I said. My assignment is to take pictures of the riot. What riot? He hesitated, twirling the ice in my drink. I'm sorry, I hesitated, twirling the ice in my drink. At the track, on Derby Day, the Black Panthers, I stared at him again. Don't you read the newspapers? The grin on his face had collapsed. What the hell are you talking about? Well, maybe I shouldn't be telling you, I shrugged. But hell, everybody else seems to know. The cops and the National Guard have been getting ready for six weeks. They have 20,000 troops on alert at Fort Knox. They've warned us, all the press and photographers, to wear helmets and special vests like flak jackets. We were told to expect shooting. No, he said. He shouted. His hands flew up and hovered momentarily between us, as if to ward off the words he was hearing. Then he whacked his fist on the bar. Those sons of bitches! God Almighty! The Kentucky Derby! He kept shaking his head. No, Jesus! That's almost too bad to believe! Now he seemed to be sagging on the stool, and when he looked up, his eyes were misty. Why? Why here? Don't they respect anything? I shrugged again. It's not just the Panthers. The FBI says busloads of white crazies are coming in from all over the country to mix with the crowd and attack all at once, from every direction. They'll be dressed like everybody else. You know, coats and ties and all that. But when the trouble starts, well, that's when the cops are so that's why the cops are so worried. He sat for a moment, looking hurt and confused, and not quite able to digest all of this terrible news. Then he cried out, Oh, Jesus, what in the name of God is happening in this country? Where can you get away from it? Not here, I said, picking up my bag. Thanks for the drink, and good luck. He grabbed my arm, urging me to have another. But I said I was overdue at the press club, and hustled off to get my act together for the awful spectacle. At the airport newsstand, I picked up a courier journal, the the scan and scan the front page headlines. Nixon sends GIs into Cambodia to hit Reds. B-52s raid, then 2,000 GIs advance 20 miles. 4,000 U.S. troops deployed near Yale as tension grows over Panther protest. At the bottom of the page was a photo of Diane Crump, soon to become the first woman jockey ever to ride in the Kentucky Derby. The photographer had snapped her, stopping in the barn area to fondle her Mount Fathom. The rest of the paper was spotted with ugly war news and stories of student unrest. There was no mention of any trouble brewing at a university in Ohio called Kent State. I went to the Hertz desk to pick up my car, but the moon-faced young swinger in charge said they didn't have any. You can't rent one anywhere, he assured me. Our derby reservations have been booked for six weeks. 
I explained that my my agent had confirmed a white Chrysler convertible for me that afternoon, but he shook his head. Maybe we'll have a cancellation. Where are you staying? I shrugged. Where's the Texas crowd staying? I want to be with my people. He sighed. My friend, you're in trouble. This town is flat full. Always is for the Derby. I leaned closer to him, half whispering. Look, I'm from Playboy. How would you like a job? He backed off quickly. What? Come on now. What kind of a job? Never mind, I said. You just blew it. I swept my bag off the counter and went to find a cab. The bag is a valuable prop in this kind of work. Mine has a lot of baggage tags on it. San Francisco, L.A., New York, Lima, Rome, Bangkok, that sort of thing. And the most prominent tag of all is is a very special plastic-coated thing that says, Photog, Playboy Mag. I bought it from a pimp in Vail, Colorado, and he told me how to use it. Never mention Playboy until you're sure they've seen this thing first, he said. Then, when, the, when you see them notice it, that's the time to strike. They'll go belly up every time. This thing is magic, I tell you. Pure magic. Well, maybe so. I used it on the poor geek in the bar, and now, humming along in a yellow cab towards town, I felt a little guilty about jangling the poor bugger's brains with that evil fantasy. But what the hell? Anybody who wanders around the world saying, Hell yes, I'm from Texas, deserves whatever happens to him. And he had, after all, come here once again to make a 19th century ass of himself in the midst of some jaded, atavistic freakout with nothing to recommend it except to recommend it except a very sellable tradition. Early in our chat, Jimbo had told me that he hasn't missed a derby since 1954. The little lady won't come anymore, he said. She just grits her teeth and turns me loose for this one. And when I say loose, I do mean loose. I toss $10 bills around like they were going out of style. Horses, whiskey, women. Shit, there's women in this town that'll do anything for money. Why not? Money is a good thing to have in these twisted times. Even Richard Nixon is hungry for it. Only a few days before the derby, he said. If I had any money, I'd invest it in the stock market. And the market, meanwhile, continued its grim slide. The next day was heavy. With only 30 hours until post time, I had no press credentials, and, according to the sports editor of the Louisville Courier Courier Journal, no hopes at all of getting any. Worse, I needed two sets, one for myself and another for Ralph Steadman, the English illustrator who was coming from London to do some derby drawings. All I knew about him was that this was his first visit to the United States. And the more I pondered that fact, the more it gave me the fear. How could he bear up under the heinous culture shock of being lifted out of London and plunged into a drunken mob scene at the Kentucky Derby? There was no way of knowing. Hopefully he would arrive at least a day or so ahead and give himself time to get acclimated. Maybe a few hours of peaceful sightseeing in the bluegrass country around Lexington. My plan was to pick him up at the airport in a huge Pontiac ball buster I'd rented from a used car salesman named Colonel Quick, then whisk him off to some peaceful setting that might remind him of England. Colonel Quick had solved the car problem and money four times the normal rate, had bought two rooms in a scum box on the outskirts of town. The only other kink was the task of convincing the moguls at Churchill Downs that Scanlands was such a prestigious sporting journal that common sense compelled them to give us two sets of the best press tickets. This was not easily done. My first call to the publicity office resulted in total failure. The press handler was shocked at the idea that anyone would be stupid enough to apply for press credentials two days before the derby. Hell, you can't be serious, he said. The deadline was two months ago. The press box is full. There's no more room. And what the hell is Scanlands Monthly anyway? I uttered a painful groan. Didn't the London office call you? They're flying an artist over to do the paintings. Stedman. He's uh, Irish, I think. Very famous over there. Yes, I just got in from the coast. The San Francisco office told me we were all set. He seemed interested. 
and even sympathetic, but there was nothing he could do. I flattered him with more gibberish, and finally he offered a compromise. He could get us two passes to the clubhouse grounds, but the clubhouse itself, especially the press box, were out of the question. That sounds a little weird, I said. It's unacceptable. We must have access to everything, all of it. The spectacle, the people, the pageantry, and certainly the race. You don't think we came all this way to watch the damn thing on television, do you? One way or another, we'll get inside. Maybe we'll have to bribe a guard, or even mace somebody. I had picked up a spray can of mace in a downtown drugstore for five ninety eight, and suddenly, in the midst of that phone talk, I was struck by the hideous possibilities of using it out at the track. Macing ushers at the narrow gates to the clubhouse inner sanctum, then slipping quickly inside, firing a huge load of mace into the governor's box just as the race starts, or macing helpless drunks in the clubhouse restroom for their own good. By noon on Friday, I was still without credentials and still unable to locate Stedman. For all I knew, he'd changed his mind and gone back to London. Finally, after giving up on Stedman and trying unsuccessfully to reach my man in the press office, I decided my only hope for credentials was to go out to the track and confront the man in person with no warning, demanding only one pass now instead of two, and talking very fast with a strange lilt in my voice, like a man trying hard to control some inner frenzy. On the way out, I stopped at the the motel desk to cash a check. Then, as a useless afterthought, I asked if by any wild chance a Mr. Stedman had checked in. The old lady on the desk was about 50 years old and very peculiar looking. When I mentioned Stedman's name, she nodded, without looking up from whatever she was writing, and said in a low voice, low voice You bet he did. Then she favored me with a big smile. Yes, indeed, Mr. Stedman just left for the racetrack. Is he a friend of yours? I shook my head. I'm supposed to be working with him, but I don't even know what he looks like. Now, God damn it, I'll have to find him in that mob at the track. She chuckled. You won't have any trouble finding him. You could pick that man out of any crowd. Why, I asked. What's wrong with him? What does he look like? Well, she said, still grinning. He's the funniest looking thing I've seen in a long time. He has this uh, this growth all over his face. As a matter of fact, it's all over his head, she nodded. You'll know him when you see him. Don't worry about that. Creeping Jesus, I thought. That screws the press cr- credentials. I had a vision of some nerve-rattling geek all covered with matted hair and st- string warts showing up in the press office and demanding Scanlon's press packet. Well, what the hell? We could always load up on acid and spend the day roaming around the clubhouse grounds with big sketch pads, laughing hysterically at the natives and swilling mint juleps so the cops wouldn't think we're abnormal. Perhaps even make the act pay. Set up an easel with a big sign saying, Let a foreign artist paint your portrait, ten dollars each. Do it now! I took the expressway out to the track, driving very fast and jumping the monster car back and forth between lanes, driving with a beer in one hand and my mind so muddled that I almost crushed a Volkswagen full of nuns when I swerved to catch the right exit. There was a slim chance, I thought, that I might be able to catch the ugly Britisher before he checked in, but Stedman was already in the press box when I got there, a bearded young Englishman wearing a tweed coat and RAF sunglasses. There was nothing particularly odd about him. No facial veins or clumps of bristly warts. I told him about the motel woman's description and he seemed puzzled. Don't let it bother you, I said. Just just keep in mind for the next few days that we're in Louis, Louisville, Kentucky. Not London. Not even New York. This place is weird. You're lucky that mental defective at the motel didn't jerk a pistol out of the cash register and blow a big hole in you. I laughed, but he looked worried. Just pretend you're visiting a huge outdoor loony bin, I said. If the, inmate, if the inmates get out of control, we'll soak them with mace. I showed him the can of Chemical Billy, resisting the urge to fire it across the room at a rat-faced man typing diligently in the associated press section. 
We were standing at the bar, sipping the management scotch and congratulating each other on our sudden, unexplained luck in picking up two sets of fine press credentials. The lady at the desk had, a, had been very friendly to him, he said. I just told her my name, and she gave me the whole works. By mid-afternoon, we had everything under control. We had seats looking down on the finish line, color TV, and a free bar in the press room and a selection of passes that would take us anywhere from the clubhouse roof to the jockey room. The only thing we lacked was unlimited access to the clubhouse's inner sanctum in sections F and G. And I felt we needed that, to see the whiskey gentry in action. The governor, a swinish neo-Nazi hack named Louis Nunn, would be in G, along with Barry Goldwater and Colonel Sanders. I felt we'd be legal in a box in G where we could rest and sip juleps, soak up a bit of atmosphere and the Derby's special vibrations. The bars and dining rooms are also in F and G, and the clubhouse bars on Derby Day are a very special kind of scene. Along with the politicians, society bells, and local captains of commerce, every half-mad dingbat who ever had any pretensions to anything at all within 500 miles of Louisville, will show up there to get strutting drunk and slap a lot of backs and generally make himself obvious. The paddock bar is probably the best place in the track to sit and watch faces. Nobody minds being stared at. That's what they're in there for. Some people spend most of their time in the paddock. They can hunker down at one of the many wooden tables, lean back in a comfortable chair and watch the ever-changing odds flash up and down on the big tote board outside the window. Black waiters in white serving jackets move through the crowd with trays of drinks while the experts ponder their racing forms and the the hunch betters pick lucky numbers or scan the lineups for right-sounding names. There is a constant flow of traffic to and from the paramutual windows outside in the wooden corridors. Then, as post time nears, the crowd thins out as people go back to their boxes. Clearly, we were going to have to figure out some, some way to spend more time in the clubhouse tomorrow, but the walk-around press passes to F and G were only good for 30 minutes at a time, presumably to allow the newspaper types to rush in and out for photos or quick interviews, but to prevent drifters like Stedman and me from spending all day in the clubhouse, harassing the gentry and rifling the odd, odd handbags or two while cruising around the boxes, or macing the governor. The time limit was no problem on Friday, but on Derby Day, the walk-around passes would be in heavy demand. And since it took about 10 minutes to get from the press box to the paddock and 10 more minutes to get back, that didn't leave much time for serious people watching. And unlike most of the others in the press box, we didn't give a hoot in hell what was happening on the track. We had come there to watch the real beasts perform. Later, Friday afternoon, we went out on the balcony of the press box and I tried to describe the difference between what we were seeing today and what would be happening tomorrow. This was the first time I'd been to a derby in 10 years, but before that, when I lived in Louisville, I used to go every year. Now, looking down from the press box, I pointed to the huge grassy meadow enclosed by the track. That whole thing, I said, will be jammed with people, 50,000 or so, and most of them staggering drunk. It's a fantastic scene, thousands of people fainting, crying, copulating, trampling each other, and fighting with broken whiskey bottles. We'll have to spend some time out there, but it's hard to move around. Too many bodies. Is it safe out there? Will we ever come back? Sure, I said. We'll just have to be careful not to step on anybody's stomach and start a fight. I shrugged. Hell, this clubhouse scene right below us will be almost as bad as the infield. Thousands of raving, stumbling drunks getting angrier and angrier as they lose more and more money. By mid-afternoon, they'll be guzzling mint juleps with both hands and vomiting on each other between races. The whole place will be jammed with bodies, shoulder to shoulder. It's hard to move around. The aisles will be slick with vomit. People falling down and grabbing at your legs to keep from being stomped. 
drunks pissing on themselves in the betting lines, dropping handfuls of money and fighting to stoop over and, and pick it up. He looked so nervous that I laughed. I'm just kidding, I said. Don't worry, at the, at the first hint of trouble, I'll start pumping this chemical billy into the crowd. He had done a few good sketches, but so far we hadn't seen that special kind of face that I felt we would need for the lead drawing. It was a face I'd seen a thousand times at every derby I'd ever been to. I saw it in my head as the mask of whiskey gentry, a pretentious mix of booze, failed dreams, and a terminal identity crisis, the inevitable result of too much inbreeding in a closed and ignorant culture. One of the key genetic rules in breeding dogs, horses, or any other kind of thoroughbred is that close inbreeding tends to magnify the weak points in a bloodline as well as strong points. In horse breeding, for instance, there is a definite risk in breeding two fast horses who are both a little crazy. The offspring will likely be very fast and also very crazy, so the trick in breeding thoroughbreds is to retain the good traits and filter out the bad. But the breeding of humans is not so wisely supervised, particularly in a narrow southern society where the closest kind of inbreeding is not only stylish and acceptable, but far from convenient, or f- but far more convenient to the parents than setting their offspring free to find their own mates, for their own reasons and in their own ways. God damn, did you hear about Smitty's daughter? She went crazy last week in Boston and married a nigger. So the face I was trying to find in Churchill Downs that weekend was a symbol, in my own mind, of the whole doomed atavistic culture that makes the Kentucky Derby what it is. On our way back to the motel after Friday's races, I warned Stedman about some of the other problems we'd have to cope with. Neither of us had brought any strange illegal drugs, so we would have to get by on booze. You should almost you should keep in mind, I said, that almost everybody you talk to from now on will be drunk. People who seem very pleasant at first might suddenly swing at you for no reason at all. He nodded, staring straight ahead. He seemed to be getting a little numb, and I tried to cheer him up by inviting him to dinner that night with my brother. Back at the motel, we talked for a while about America, the South, England, just relaxing a bit before dinner. There was no way either of us could have known at the time that it would be the last normal conversation we would have. From that point on, the weekend became a vicious, drunken nightmare. We both went completely to pieces. The main problem was my poor attachment to Louisville, which naturally led me to meeting old, with old friends, relatives, etc., many of whom were in the process of falling apart, going mad, plotting divorces, cracking up under the strain of terrible debts, or recovering from bad bad accidents. Right in the middle of the whole frenzied derby action, a member of my own family had to be institutionalized. This added a certain amount of strain to the situation, and since poor Stedman had no choice but to take whatever came his way, he was subjected to shock after shock. Another problem was his habit of sketching people he met in various social situations I dragged him into, then giving them the sketches. The results were always unfortunate. I warned him several times about letting the subject see his foul renderings, but for some perverse reason he kept doing it. Consequently, he was regarded with fear and loathing by nearly everyone who'd seen or even heard about his work. He couldn't understand it. It's sort of a joke, he kept saying. Why, in England, it's quite normal. People don't take offense. They understand that I'm just just putting them on a bit. Fuck England, I said. This is middle America. These people regard what you're doing to them as a brutal, bilious insult. Look, what happened last night? I thought my brother was going to tear your head off. Stedman shook his head sadly. But I liked him. He struck me as a very decent, straightforward sort. Look, Ralph, I said. Let's not kid ourselves. That was a very horrible drawing you gave him. It was the face of a monster. It got on his nerves very badly. I shrugged. Why in hell do you think we left the restaurant so fast? I thought it was because of the mace, he said. What mace? He grinned. When you shot it at the the head waiter, don't you remember? 
Well, that was nothing, I said. I missed him, and we were leaving anyway. But it got all over us, he said. The room was full of that damn gas. Your brother was sneezing, and his wife was crying. My eyes hurt for two hours. I couldn't see to draw when we got back to the motel. That's right, I said. The stuff got on her leg, didn't it? She was angry, he said. Yeah, well, okay. Let's just figure we fucked up about equally on that one, I said. But from now on, let's try to be careful when we're around people I know. You won't sketch them, and I won't mace them. We'll just try to relax and get drunk. Right, he said. We'll go naive. We'll go native. It was Saturday morning, the day of the big race, and we were having bre- breakfast in a plastic hamburger palace called the Fish Meat Village. Our rooms were just across the road in a brown suburban mo- hotel. They had a dining room, but the food was so bad that we couldn't handle it anymore. The waitresses seemed to be suffering from shin splints. They moved around very slowly, moaning and cursing the darkies in the kitchen. Stedman liked the meat fish place because it had fish and chips. I preferred the French toast, which was really pancake batter, fried to the proper thickness, and then chopped out with a sort of cookie cutter to resemble pieces of toast. Beyond drink and lack of sleep... Our only real problem at that point was the question of access to the clubhouse. Finally, we decided to go ahead and steal two passes if necessary, rather than miss part of the action. This was the last coherent decision we were able to make for the next 48 hours. From that point on, almost from the very moment we started out to the track, we lost all control of events and spent the rest of the weekend churning around in a sea of drunken horrors. My notes and recollections from Derby Day are somewhat scrambled. But now, looking at the big red notebook I carried all through that scene, I see more or less what happened. The book itself is somewhat mangled and bent. Some of the pages are torn, others are shriveled and stained by what appears to be whiskey. But taken as a whole, with sporadic memory flashes, the notes seem to tell the story. To wit, rain all night until dawn, no sleep. Christ, here we go. A nightmare of mud and madness. But no, by noon the sun burns through. Perfect day, not even humid. Stedman is now worried about fire. Somebody told him about the clubhouse catching on fire two years ago. Could it happen again? Horrible. Trapped in the press box. Holocaust. A hundred thousand people fighting to get out. Drunks screaming in the flames and, and the mud. Crazed horses running wild. Blind in the smoke, grandstand collapsing into the, into the flames with us on roof. Poor Ralph is about to crack, drinking heavily into the hague and hague. Out to the track in a cab, avoid that terrible parking in the people's front yards. Twenty-five dollars each, toothless old men on the street with big, si- big signs. Park here, flagging cars in the yard. That's fine, boy. Never mind the tulips, wild hair on his head, straight up like a clump of reeds, sidewalks full of people all moving in the same direction, towards Churchill Downs, kid hauling coolers and blankets, teeny boppers in tight pink shorts, many blacks, black dude in white, black dudes in white felt hats with leopard skin bands, cops waving traffic along. The mob was thick for many blocks around the track, very slow getting in the crowd, very hot. On the way to the press box elevator, just inside the clubhouse, we came on a row of of soldiers all carrying a long white riot sticks, about two platoons with helmets. A man walking next to us said they were waiting for the governor and his party. Stedman eyed them nervously. Why do they keep those clubs? Black Panthers, I said. Then I remembered good old Jimbo at the airport, and I wondered what he was thinking right now. Probably very nervous. The place was teeming with cops and soldiers. We pressed on through the crowd, through many gates, past the paddock, where the jockeys bring the horses out and parade around for a while before each race so the betters can get a good look. Five million dollars they will bet today, 
Many winners. More losers. What the hell? The press gate was jammed up with people trying to get in, shouting at the guards, waving strange press badges. Chicago Sporting Times, Pittsburgh Police Athletic League. They were all turned away. Move on, fella. Make way for more working, more, more of the working press. We shoved through the crowd and into the elevator, then quickly up to the free bar. Why not? Get it on. Very hot today. Not feeling well. Must be this rotten climate. The press box was cool and airy, plenty of room to walk around, and balcony seats for watching the race or looking down at the crowd. We got a betting sheet and went outside. Pink faces with stylish southern sag, old ivy styles, seersucker coats and button-down collars, may blossom senility, Stedman's phrase, burnt out early or maybe just not much to to bum in the first place. Not much energy in these faces, not much curiosity, suffering in silence. Nowhere to go after thirty in this life. Just hang on and humor the children. Let the young enjoy themselves while they can. Why not? The Grim Reaper comes early in this league. Banshees on the lawn at night, screaming out there beside the little iron nigger in jockey clothes. Maybe he's the one who's screaming. Bad DTs and too many snarls at the bridge club. Going down with the stock market. Oh, Jesus. The kid was wrecked. has wrecked the new car. Wrapped it around the big stone pillar at the bottom of the driveway. Broken leg? Twisted eye? Send him off to Yale. They can cure anything up there. Yale? Did you see today's paper? New Haven is under siege. Yale is swarming with Black Panthers. I tell you, Colonel, the world has gone mad, stone mad. Why, they tell me a goddamn woman jockey might ride in the derby today. I left Stedman sketching in paddock in the paddock bar and went off to place our bets in, on the fourth race. When I came back, he was staring intently at a group of young men around a table not far away. Jesus, look at the corruption in that face, he whispered. Look at the, look at the madness, the fear, the greed. I looked, then quickly turned my back on the table he was sketching. The face he'd picked out to draw was the face of an old friend of mine, a prep school football star in the good old days with a sleek red Chevy convertible and a, quick, and a very quick hand, it was said, with the snaps of a 32 B Bross brassiere. They called him Catman. But now, a dozen years later, I wouldn't have recognized him anywhere but here where I should have expected to find him, in the paddock bar on Derby Day. Fat, slanted eyes and a pimp smile, blue silk suit, and his friends looking like crooked bank tellers on a binge. Stedman wanted to see some Kentucky colonels, but he wasn't sure what they looked like. I told him to go back to the clubhouse men's room and look for men in white linen suits vomiting in, in the urinals. They'll usually have large brown whiskey stains in the front of their suits, I said. But watch the shoes, that's the tip-off. Most of them manage to avoid vomiting on their, on their own clothes, but they never miss their shoes. In a box not far from ours was Colonel Anna Fre- Friedman Goldman, chairman of Keeper of the Great Seal of the Honorable Order of Kentucky Colonels. Not all the 76 million or so Kentucky colonels could make it to the Derby this year, but many had kept the faith, and several days prior to the Derby, they gathered for their annual dinner at the Sealbach Hotel. The Derby, the actual race, was scheduled for late afternoon, and as the magic hour approached, I suggested to Stedman that we should probably spend some time in the infield, that boiling sea of people across the track from the clubhouse. He seemed a little nervous about it, but since none of the awful things I'd warned him about had happened so far, no race riots, firestorms, or savage drunken attacks, he shrugged and said, right, let's let's do it. To get there, we had to pass through many gates, each one a a step down in status, then through a tunnel under the track. Emerging from the tunnel was was such a culture shock that it took us a while to adjust. God Almighty, Stedman muttered. This is a Jesus, 
He plunged ahead with his tiny camera, stepping over bodies, and I followed, trying to take notes. Total chaos. No way to see the race. Not even the track. Nobody cares. Big lines at the outdoor betting windows, then stand back to watch winning numbers flash on the big board, like a giant bingo game. Old blacks arguing about bets. Hold on there, I'll handle this. Waving pint of, wi- waving pint of whiskey, fistful of dollars. Girl riding piggyback. T-shirt says, stolen from Fort Lauderdale jail. Thousands of teenagers, gro- teenagers, group singing. Let the sun shine in. Then soldiers guarding the American flag and a huge fat drunk wearing a blue football jersey, number 80, reeling around with a quarter, quart of beer in, in hand. No booze sold out here, too dangerous. No bathrooms either. Muscle Beach, Woodstock, many cops with riot sticks, but no sign of a riot. Far across the track, the clubhouse looks like a postcard from the Kentucky Derby. We went back to the clubhouse to watch the big race. When the crowd stood to face the flag and sing, My Old Kentucky Home, Stedman faced the crowd and sketched frantically. Somewhere up in the box, boxes, a voice screeched, Turn around, you hairy freak! The race itself was only two minutes long, and even from our super status seats and using 12 power glasses, there was no way to see what was really happening. Later, watching a TV rerun in the press box, we saw what happened to our horses. Holy Land, Ralph's choice, stumbled and lost his jockey in the final turn. Mine, silent screen, had the lead coming into the stretch, but faded to fifth at the finish. The winner was a 16 to 1 shot named Dust Commander. Moments after the race was over, the crowd surged wildly, wildly for the exits, rushing for cabs and buses. The next day's courier told of violence in the parking lot. People were punched and trampled. Pockets were picked. Children lost. Bottles hurled. But we missed all this, having retired to the press box for a bit of post-race drinking. By this time, we were both half crazy from too much whiskey, sun fatigue, culture shock, lack of sleep, and general dissolution. We hung around the press box enough to watch a mass interview with the winning owner, a dapper little man named Lehman, who said he had just flown into Louisville that morning from Nepal, where he'd bagged a record tiger. The sports writers murmured their admiration, and a waiter filled Lehman's glass with Chivas Regal. He had just won $127,000 with a horse that cost him $6,500 two years ago. His occupation, he said, was a retired contractor. And then he added with a big grin, "Just retire. I, I just retired." <laughs> the rest of the day, that the, the rest of that day blurs into madness. The rest of that night too, and all the next day and night. Such horrible things occurred that I can't bring myself to even think about them now, much less put them down in print. Stedman was lucky to get out of Louisville without serious injuries, and I was lucky to get out at all. One of my clearest memories of that vicious time is Ralph being attacked by one of my old friends in the billiard room of the Pendennis Club in downtown Louisville on Saturday night. The man had ripped his own shirt open to the waist before deciding that Ralph was after his wife. No blows were struck, but the emotional effects were massive. Then, a sort of final horror, Stedman put his fiendish pen to work and tried to patch things up by doing a little sketch of the girl he'd been accused of hustling. That finished us in Pendennis. Sometime around 10.30, Monday morning, I was awakened by a scratching sound at my door. I leaned out of bed and pulled the curtain back just far enough to see Stedman outside. What the fuck do you want? I shouted. What about having breakfast? He said. I lunged out of bed and tried to open the door, but it caught on the night on the night chain and banged shut again. I couldn't cope with the chain. The thing wouldn't come out of the track. So I ripped it out of the wall with a vicious jerk on the door. Ralph didn't blink. Bad luck, he muttered. I could barely see him, 
My eyes were swollen almost shut, and the sudden burst of sunlight through the door left me stunned and helpless like a sick mole. Stedman was mumbling about sickness and terrible heat. I fell back on the bed and tried to focus on him as he moved around the room in a very distracted way for a few moments, then suddenly darted over to the beer bucket and seized a Colt forty-five. Christ, I said, you're getting out of control. He nodded and ripped the cap off, taking a long drink. You know, this is really awful, he said finally. I must get out of this place. He shook his head nervously. The plane leaves at three th- at three thirty, but I don't know wh- if I'll make it. I barely heard him. My eyes had finally opened enough for me to focus on the mirror across the room, and I was stunned at the shock of recogni- recognition. For a confused instant, I thought that Ralph had brought somebody with him, a model for that one special face we'd been looking for. There he was, by God, a puffy, drink-ravaged, disease-ridden caricature, like an awful cartoon version of an old snapshot in some once-proud mother's family photo album. It was the face we'd been looking for, and it was, of course, my own. Horrible. Horrible. Maybe we should sleep a while longer, I said. Why don't you go on over to the fish meat place and eat some of those rotten fish and chips? Then come back and get me around noon. I feel too near death to hit the streets at this hour. He shook his head. No, no, I think I'll go back upstairs and work on those drawings for a while. He leaned down to fetch two more cans out of the beer bucket. I tried to work earlier, he said, but my hands keep trembling. It's terrible, terrible. You've got to stop this drinking, I said. He nodded. I know, this is no good, no good at all. But for some reason it makes me feel better. Not for long, I said. You'll probably collapse into some kind of hysterical DTs tonight. Probably just just about the time you get off the plane at Ken- Kennedy. They'll zip you up in a straitjacket and drag you down to the tombs then beat you on the kidneys with big sticks until you straighten out. He shrugged and wandered out, pulling the door shut behind him. I went back to bed for another hour or so, and later, after the daily grapefruit juice run to the Night Owl Food Mart, we had had our last meal at the Fish Fish Meat Village, a fine lunch of dough and butcher's offal, fried in, in heavy grease. By this time, Ralph wouldn't even order coffee. He kept asking for more water. It's the only thing they have that's fit for human consumption, he he explained. Then with an hour or so to kill before he had to catch the plane, we spread his drawings out on the table and pondered them for a while, wondering if he'd caught the proper spirit of the thing. But we couldn't make up our minds. His hands were shaking so badly that he had trouble holding the paper and my vision was so blurred that I could barely see what he'd drawn. Shit, I said. We both look worse than anything you've drawn here. He smiled. You know, I've been thinking about that, he said. We came down here to see this terrible scene. People all pissed out of their minds, and vomiting on themselves and all that. And now, you know you know what? It's us. Huge Pontiac ball buster blowing through traffic on the expressway. A radio news bulletin says the National Guard is massacring students at Kent State and Nixon is still bombing Cambodia. The journalist is driving, ignoring his passengers, who is now nearly naked after taking off most of his clothing, which he holds out the window, trying to wind-wash the mace out of it. His eyes are bright and red, and his face and chest are soaked with the beer he's been using to rinse the awful chemical off his flesh. The front of his woolen trousers is soaked with vomit. His his body is racked with fits of coughing and wild choking sobs. The journalist rams the car, the big car, through traffic and into a spot in front of the terminal. Then he reaches over to open the door on the passenger side and shoves shoves the Englishman out, snarling, Bug off, you worthless faggot! You twisted pig fucker! (laughs) Ha 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 ha! If I weren't sick... I'd kick your ass all the way to Bowling Green, you scum-sucking foreign geek. Mace is too good for you. 
We can do without your kind in Kentucky. Scanlands Monthly, Volume 1, Number 4, June 1970. find them in uh the proud highway and this piece uh or sorry this book um fear and loathing in america is uh the publishing of of a bunch of thompson letters from like 1968 to like the mid 70s or something so that's where i went uh, to look for the kentucky derby letters or the letters related to the kentucky derby piece since it was written in 1970, and I found a plethora. Plethora, Natalie. Gold mine, huh? It, yeah, it's a gold mine. There's some good shit I'm about to read for you in here. So Nice. Um, this first one is to Warren Hinkle. He's the possibly the owner or maybe the lead editor of Scanlands Monthly, the publication that um, Thompson was writing for when he went to cover the Kentucky Derby. Okay. Um, the person that put together, uh, fear and loathing in America left some, uh, brief descriptions for each letter. So I'll read that before each letter I'm going to read here. So this one says Thompson was leaving for Louisville the next day to cover the Kentucky Derby for Scanlands. His first choice for illustrator was the Denver Post's Pat Oliphant, who had won the 1967 Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. But Oliphant couldn't make the trip, luckily for Ralph Steadman and the future of gonzo journalism. April 28th, 1970. Woody Creek, Colorado. Dear Warren, Inra, the Kentucky Derby piece, I just talked to Pat Oliphant and found him darkly unhappy at having his unlisted veil pierced at 2.15 a.m. I didn't tell him. But he was dealing with a veteran of midnight calls to James Reston, collect, from phone booths in places like Arco, Idaho, wild queries from the far interior, demanding to know why the Soviet Army chorus wasn't allowed to perform in the U.S. One sat night, sorry, one sat night, I tracked Reston all the way up from Times Square to his weekend hideout in Leesburg, Virginia, and I got an answer that I should have taped. Wild screeching in the night. Very rude, I felt. But the call was not in vain. Anyway, Oliphant said he probably couldn't go to the Derby, but he'd like to do some drawings and would call you tomorrow, Wednesday, 429. At that point, I called a friend in San Francisco, a good photographer named Bob Chamberlain, formerly of Aspen, but I couldn't reach him either. By then it was too late to call eastward. 
So I postponed queries to Danny Lyon at Magnum and a fine young photographer in Chicago, Rob Gurlnick, who once worked for me on a word pick feature on Nixon's inauguration for the Boston Globe. Lyon, Chamberlain, and Gurlnick all have the same kind of camera eye, and from an editor's point of view, I don't see much of a difference between the three. From my point of view, I'd prefer drawings by Oliphant, or maybe Searle. But shit, by the time you get this, we'll have settled all we'll have settled all that anyway. So no point in hassling it any further for now. I'll be talking to you in a few hours. So, as far as I'm concerned, off to, to off tomorrow for Louisville. The next step as I see it will be to rush up to the horse breeding country around Lexington, 80 miles. If there's time, or if not, get out to the track and hang around the stables for a day or so. Then hunker down in the awful social whirl. The story, as I see it, is mainly in the vicious drunk southern bourbon horse shit mentality that surrounds the derby than in the derby itself. And, as a human product of that culture mentality, I think I can see it pretty clear. My first stop in Louisville will be at my mother's apartment or Mrs. Virginia Thompson at the Louisville Free Public Library. You can reach me through her, although I may or may not be staying there, depending on whether my brothers are there with their families. And if all else fails, assuming you want to reach me for some or any reason, try calling me care of Jim Pope at the Louisville Courier Courier Journal and Times. I'll check with him tomorrow about press credentials, etc., Otherwise, I'll figure on getting you at least 5,000 words, or somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000, by Thursday of next week, May 7th. I'll try for Wednesday, or maybe even Tuesday, if I stay in Louisville to write the thing, instead of rushing back here. Probably I'll do that, and probably call you on Monday to see how we stand on time and space. As for expenses, I can't say for now that they'll run what they'll run, but between RT plane ticket, car rentals, and clubhouse derby ticket expenses, I can't see less than $500. That's assuming I can stay at my mother's apartment, which I think I can. Otherwise, we might have nasty rental problems, because derby day in Louisville is like Christmas in Aspen, carnival in Rio, or a motel frenzy at the Indianapolis 500. But I, have not, but I have enough friends in Louisville, so I'm not worried about finding emergency space for myself and whatever artist, photographer we decide to send along. The $1,500 fee money looks good from here, and so does the article. I think we've stumbled on a good genetic accident. If you see any problems, call me in Louisville at the above number, or call Sandy here and have her track me down. Okay for now. If I, ca- if I can keep it in mind, I'll be after you tomorrow for the n- names, etc. of Berkeley Barb distributors who might also distribute the Aspen wallpaper. Sorry, wall poster. I'm enclosing a copy of number three, which posed such space problems that we had to drop about half the copy, including our list of advertisers and also our non-advertisers, along with local subscription rates, many special awards, and other standing heads and also a handful of local news items, which included the genealogy statement featuring you and the Chicago Ramparts wall poster. But don't worry, we'll get it in next time. Yeah, and I'm serious about running a Hinkle mugshot with the genealogy statement, so if you have one around for general PR purposes, send it along. Mm -hmm. But for Christ's sake, don't send anything slick or straight. We need photos that will make people puke and howl for their lawyers. With only one page, you have to bear down. And that's it for now. I have to get some sleep before rushing off to confront my festered childhood. God's mercy on us all. Sincerely, Hunter S. Thompson. And uh, this next one is to Pat Oliphant, the uh, illustrator from the Denver Post. This was April 29th and 30th, 1970, Woody Creek, Colorado. Dear Pat, your call a few moments ago caught me on the way to bed, hoping to get around three hours sleep before zapping off in the great white sky to Louisville for the annual horse shit and bourbon orgy. Sorry you couldn't make it. 
As I told Hinkle, I can't think of anyone who could do that kind of scene as well as you, as well as you could, even Searle or Magnum photographers. So probably what I'll do is now is locate a kid photographer in Chicago who worked with me on a Nixon inaugural piece. He had a fine, strange eye. Anyway, I won't be getting to bed today, blowing off for Kentucky in a few hours. But if I get hung up at Denver Airport, I'll give a call and maybe we can have a drink. Otherwise, I'll try to catch you on my way back next Wednesday, May 6th, and maybe we can figure out a fine American folk scene we can do together. Maybe the Indianapolis 500 or a Labor Day picnic in Detroit. Whatever's right. Meanwhile, I'm enclosing copies of the first three issues of the Aspen Wall Poster, a total experiment in the unworked fields of the newest new journalism. Sometime this summer, we may try to pressure you into doing a cover for us on the order of Maldin's cover for the Chicago Journal Journalism Review. But I'll talk to you before then. And if I miss you in Denver, come on over to Woody Creek for a few crazed days, any time. Just give a ring far enough ahead to be sure I'm here, which is almost all of the time. We have a huge house with plenty of space for anything you want to bring. Kids, dogs, bikes, guns, whatever. Even wives. As for the wall posters, I can't apologize for all the wretched mistakes, but if you read the copies in order, one, two, three, you'll see that we're beating them, mainly by firing all the printer's experts. Fuck them. They should, they should be put in welfare camps for the congenital, congenitally incompetent. Okay, for now, I have to get upstairs and call Hinkle and get my plane ticket and call my poor mother to warn her that I'm coming back once again to whip the shit out of everything I was raised and brought up to hold dear. Salah. And, okay, next one is to Bill Cardoso of the Boston Globe. The description uh, for this letter, it says, At the last minute, Scanlon's Monthly assigned British illustrator Ralph Steadman known for his work in the Times of London and England's political satire magazine, Private Eye, to accompany Thompson to the Kentucky Derby. Stedman's savage, dead-on drawings would define the gonzo look. May 15, 1970, Woody Creek, Colorado. Billy, your letter was waiting for me last week when I got back from Louisville. Very weird. I went there to write a strange piece on the spectacle for Scanlon's Monthly. And the whole scene nearly killed me, along with the British illustrator on his first trip to the U.S. See Scanlan's number four, June, I think, for details. It's a shitty article, a classic of irresponsible journalism, but to get it all done, at all, I had to be locked in a New York hotel room for three days with copy boys collecting each sheet out of the typewriter as I wrote it, whipping it off on the telecopier to San Francisco where the printer was standing by on overtime. Horrible way to write anything. Anyway, you should have given a ring or hung around long enough to get into the derby action with us. I was there about seven days, then up to New York for the final writing. Horrible, horrible. Maybe you can zap out here and do a story on new journalism and newer politics in Aspen. I am running for sheriff in the fall. We're about to take over the town. Okay for now. Let me know if you or Susan can find us any outlets. Thanks, Hunter. The next letter was again to Warren Hinkle of Scanlands Monthly. This description says, Thompson and his new British cohort put themselves in quite a mint julep haze through Derby Week in Louisville. The result was the brilliantly written and illustrated article, The Kentucky Derby is Decadent and Depraved, which appeared in the June 1970 issue of Scanlon's. The bylines read, Written under duress by Hunter S. Thompson, and Sketched with Eyebrow Pencil and Lipstick by Ralph Steadman. Mm -hmm. May 15, 1970, Woody Creek, Colorado. Dear Warren, Well, what the fuck can a human being say after a scene like that last one? I just read over the Derby article for the first time, and it strikes me as a monument to whatever kind of limbo exists between humor and tragedy. I wish there'd been a time to do it better, or room to run all that bullshit about Louisville Super Agnew Society. 
Goddard and I cut about 4,000 words on Sunday night, dropping most of the socio-philosophical flashbacks and weird memory jogs in favor of a straight chronological narrative. And in retrospect, I think that was the only way to go. With another week, I might have honed it down to a finer, meatier edge. But in fact, we were lucky to get anything at all. Returning to the scenes of my youth was not, all in all, an exceptionally wise idea. After four days without sleep, due to all-night, soul-ripping doom and disaster talk, I arrived in New York in a state of crazed angst, far gone in a pill stupor and barely able to think, much less right. Goddard's ominous patience was all that kept me functioning. He's a first-class head to have on your side in that kind of crunch, and I'm sorry to hear he's leaving. God only knows what will happen to the New York end of your action without his calming influence. On the several occasions when I nearly ran amok, particularly when I lost my wallet with all cash and credit cards, in a tavern mob watching the Knicks-Lakers game on TV, Goddard's steady hand was, only, was the only anchor in town. Once again, he's good, and I hate to see him go. Which is neither here nor there, for now, particularly in light of the heinous imbrog imbroglio I made myself a party last, to last weekend. I was never sure what was happening, or why, in terms of timing, but early on I had the feeling that I should have gone to San Francisco instead of New York to do the writing. The Royalton was fine, but I'd have, have been a hell of a lot happier, and probably more functional, if I'd been in a position to know what was going on. But what the hell, we're over that hump now, for good or ill, and my only consolation in reading the article is that I helped Stedman get his drawings. He's good, probably better than anybody working in this country, but they didn't like him in Louisville, and not at the New York Times either. The Times offered him a job, but turned down all his ex extant, extant drawings of Nixon, etc. As for Scanlon's general action, well, what little I saw of the New York scene leaves me slightly worried. Something is badly lacking in, in the focus, the main thrust and $10,000 $10, ads in the New York Times only emphasize what's missing, which is none of my business, really, and most definitely out of place after putting you through all that jangled action last week. But under normal sleep-cured conditions and a fairly straight head, I'd like to see Scanlon's work. Maybe it is, but the vibes I got in New York were somewhat mixed, and the only cure I can see is, the, is impossibly drastic. The fucker should work. It's one of the best ideas in the history of journalism. But thus far, the focus is missing. Or maybe it just seems that way to me. Perhaps something missing in my something is missing in my own focus. And I won't argue that, but... Well, I suspect there's a heavy difference between Scanlan's problems and mine. But maybe not. And fuck the whole business anyway. I have enough problems with this goddamn one-page wall poster and my slow-boiling sheriff's campaign. Fear and loathing in the outback. Fuck them. We will beat them like gongs. Not many months left in this era. Not even a year. As I see it, and maybe less. Maybe it's already gone. Which hardly matters for now. All I really meant to do here, when I started, was to say that I wish I could have written a better derby piece. And also to advise you to send my check to Lynn Nesbitt at the International Famous Agency, 1301 Avenue of the Americas, New York City, 10019. My advisors have warned me that agents get 10% of everything, fair, foul, or otherwise. Why not? And if ever, in small moments, I might chance to feel a hair guilty for not coughing up a super organized soul piece. All I have to do is summon up the memory of Sydney booming off at dusk to Gallagher's and then to the garden hunkered down in a soft back seat of that gray Cadillac with his evil chauffeur and bodyguard. Christ, I asked that surly middleweight fucker if there, if there was any ice in the bucket in Sydney Lyons' office and he looked at me like it was all he could do to restrain himself from ripping out my floating rib and eating it. I was tempted to mace the bastard, but instead I backed off and went downstairs to have a scotch with poor Stedman. Indeed. And in closing I remain, yours for peace in our time, Hunter. 
All right, I've got a couple more letters I really got to read about this <laughs> Kentucky Derby piece. Let me find them here. These are all these are all written. Obviously, as you could kind of hear, they're written during the time he was about to prepare for his campaign for sheriff. So this was around that same nice. era of Thompson existence and work. Okay, the next one is to Lynn Nesbitt, who is uh, Thompson's agent. It says, the Kentucky Derby story came out so well, Thompson told his agent to try and sell it in Hollywood. May 21st, 1970, Woody Creek, Colorado. Dear Lynn, here's a ragged copy of the Kentucky Derby piece I did for Scanlands. No clean copy exists. Due to, the, due to circumstances beyond my control at the time. I was locked in that stinking hotel room with my head full of pills and no sleep for six days, working at top speed and messengers grabbing each page out of the typewriter just as soon as I finished it. No carbon, no rewrite, no time to even look back on what I'd written earlier. But what the hell, my main concern now is to get paid for the rotten ordeal, because I have no money. And by my, and by my count, Hinkle owes me, or us as it were, a total of... $1,977.27. This would cure most of my really urgent problems like rent, phone, food bills, etc. I can't imagine Inkle refusing to pay the tab, so unless you foresee real problems, you might consider just sending me a check as soon as possible. Like maybe today. Or yesterday. In any case, please let me know on this score. Thanks. And meanwhile, here's an odd notion that stuck in my head after Carol, far gone in a fit of levity during our phone talk, mentioned something about selling this derby ordeal as a film of some sort, which strikes me now as a notion of exceptional merit. No question about it, about it at all. What we have here is a classic of the narrative art, the strange and heartwarming story of a wild-haired English artist and a crazed expatriate southern journalist hurled into the, into the maw of the heinous Kentucky Derby spectacle. Indeed, their hopes, their fears, and their final dissolution against this awful background. I see it as a combination of Dr. Strangelove and Gone with the Wind. And on that basis, I urge you to sell it at once. The narrative framework is all here in the article, and much of the rest exists on a chunk of background color, social comment, and tangent fantasies that had to be cut from the final Scanlands version. A film treatment would be no problem, and we could do all the camera work at next year's derby if the buggers will let, him, let me in. But, of course, I have wigs for that kind of rude action. Anyway, I think it's a fine idea, but of course, you'll have to read the bare bones, MS, and clothes to see what I mean. No doubt, the final film product will, be, will gross about $30 million, particularly in the midst of a depression movie boom. Let me know what you think and how the offer stacks up. Meanwhile, I'll be waiting, in a maelstrom of debt and anguish, for a check for the Scanlands article. I realize you have certain logistics problems, but with that massive organization at your command, I have every faith in your ability to find somebody to cope with this thing. Thanks, Hunter. And let's do one more. What do you say? Okay. Are you sure? Are you ready for this? Yeah. This is a good one. Okay. Wait. Is that one? No. Yeah, let's do one more. This one's to Ralph Stedman. <coughs> oh, sure. This one. No. Yeah, let's do the Ralph Stedman. <clears throat> okay. This one is to the illustrator from the article. Ralph Stedman. The description of the letter says, The Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. Launched a remarkable res correspondence as well as a brilliant collaboration over three decades and beyond. June 2nd, 1970. Woody Creek, Colorado. Dear Ralph... You filthy, twisted pervert. I'll beat your ass like a gong for that drawing you did of me. You bastard, stay out of Kentucky from now on. And Colorado, too. <laughs> Fuck you. 
And so much for that. I just saw the June Scanlands. The article is useless, except for the flashes of style and tone it captures. But I suspect you and I are the only ones who can really appreciate it. The drawings were fine, although I think they fucked up the layout, as usual, quite badly. <laughs> they also cut about one-third of the article, in addition to the 4,000 or so words that Don and I cut in New York. In all, a bad show, and I'm sorry it wasn't better. Maybe next time. I'd like nothing better than to work with you on one of these strange binges again. And to that end, I'll tell my agent to bill us as a package, for good or ill. Nothing binding, but certainly a notion worth trying. The only saving grace of that derby scene was having you around to keep me on my rails. What are you up to now? How did New York pan out? What next? <laughs> In a week or so... I'll send you some photos of our main LBJ style antagonist in the fall election. Also my opponents for sheriff. With photos and some text, maybe you can rush up some drawings for the Aspen wall poster. In fact, we'd used either one of those Nixon drawings right now, if not as a cover, then as a big inside drawing. Issue number four, now going to press, is double size and folded, four pages in other words, a cover, a back, and two inside pages. We need it. We need good art. Pat Oliphant from the Denver Post has said he'll do a cover for us. I'll see him this weekend in Denver at a formation meeting for the Radical Journalist Union or some such. He said he was looking for you in London that same weekend when you were in Louisville with me. Strange irony, since he was the first artist I called to work with me on the story. He said you were one of the few artists in England he wanted to meet. Okay, for now. I'll send you the photos and other data for the drawings I mentioned. But in the meantime, send us anything you can't sell. Or for that matter, anything you feel would be a good sort of interior advertisement for you in regards the U.S. press. We're constantly sending wall posters to editors in New York, San Francisco, L.A., etc., so a heavy, weird drawing in the wall poster might get you a good assignment somewhere. Or maybe not. I can't say for sure. Why not get Private Eye or The Times to send you over here to cover my sheriff's campaign, a Stedman Eye view of small-town politics in the American Rockies. In fact, that sounds good enough to send to my agent. If you haven't picked up anybody to represent you, let me know, and I'll see if Len Lynn Nesbitt from I IFA wants to handle your act. She's about as good as they come, I'm told. She has Tom Wolf and that sort of thing. Even me. So let me know on all fronts. Ciao, Hunter. So there's kind of a backstory and some context to the uh, weird twisted article we just read. Awesome. Awesome. Too bad yeah. they didn't make it into a film, right? I know. Yeah, that'd be cool. Of course, it's not too late. Well... Who would play Hunter? Johnny Depp uh, again? Why not? Yeah, that'd be cool. As he gets older, he could only fill that role even better, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, well, this outro is now uh, almost 30 minutes long, so let's wrap it up. All right. Um, Thank you for reading that stuff. Oh, don't thank me. It was my pleasure. I enjoy reading all this stuff. It's entertaining, even though I sound... Like, I'm not entertained. I'm just tired. I think I've read all of Hunter S. Thompson's stuff at a minimum of twice, if not ten times. So, um, there will be more to come. Nice. Um, this one was fitting because the Kentucky Derby is coming up this weekend. So, yeah. that makes sense. The um, Kentucky Derby. Some of them may be more randomly placed throughout. I'll probably I'll probably record another one just to have it waiting in case we have some bandwidth left at the end of any month in the future and we'll just throw it up sounds you know, good pick out a good one and we'll read it it's always so. great other than that i don't know we'll probably have tj on the next episode uh hopefully at least i don't know what we're going to be doing i got a couple of interviews i want to try and line up but uh those are all in the works so nothing to speak of at the moment but um Shit, we're going to see Doug Stanhope in a couple weeks. That'll be great. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. I'm really looking forward to that. So that'll be something to talk about for sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, 
We are Undoctrinated. Um, follow us on Twitter at Undoctrinated1. Yeah. Follow yep. us on Instagram, too. Please. Undoctrinated Podcast. Yep. And we're UndoctrinatedPodcast at gmail.com. If you want to email us, please hit subscribe and uh, continue to listen. Tell your friends. Yeah. And, Spread the word. And uh, enjoy. We've got big, big things coming up. So you guys will be pleased. Yep. Stay tuned. It's 2 a.m. And you're sitting at